Hello, my name is Kevin Nanikowski, and this episode is on language. One of the first approaches to language came from B.F. Skinner, who came up with the learning behaviorist theory and, with respect to language, stated that language was a result of operant conditioning stemming from a child's blank slate. This approach was heavily criticized by Noam Chomsky, who is sometimes called the father of modern linguistics. Chomsky developed the universal grammar theory, which argues even though not all languages are the same, any given language will have a right and wrong sentence structure that native speakers can recognize. This ability is innate, and so we have the nativist approach to linguistics. Universal grammar theory also gave rise to Chomsky's language acquisition device, which was just a hypothetical brain area that children are born with, allowing them to rapidly pick up a language. So back to how Chomsky argued against the behaviorist approach to language. He observed that neither direct guidance nor reinforcement is necessary to learn a language, and so he refuted the behaviorist argument. Earlier writings from Chomsky were also influencing the creation of the sapphire Whorf hypothesis, which you've probably heard of called the linguistic relativity hypothesis. Do you remember the premise of the linguistic relativity hypothesis? Well, have you ever thought how language dictates your world? Well, linguistic relativists have. They argue your whole world view is dictated by the language you use. It's a more deterministic view, linguistic determinism. And it goes on to say that every cognitive process is dictated via language. Linguistic determinism is the strong hypothesis, whereas linguistic influence, where language just controls your cognition, is the weak hypothesis. Next, the language experience approach created in the 60s stated that acquisition of a language occurs by total immersion, thus an experience. Learning language comes from stories, listening to conversations, writing, etc. Language experience approach is more so an approach to learning than its origin. Although, the approach seems to pull ideas from the social interactionist theory by Bogotsky discussed in the socialization episode. So there's the universal grammar theory, learning behaviorist approach, language acquisition device, sapphire worth hypothesis, linguistic relativity hypothesis, language experience approach, and social interactionist theory. That was a lot in a quick short time. Next, let's discuss parts of speech. So first, there are morphemes, which are just the basic units of language containing meaning, such as plural dogs. Dog and the letter S are both morphemes which each have a different meaning. Usually, multiple morphemes can create a lexeme, which is different forms that a single word can take, such as the same lexeme for run, running, or ran. Phonemes, on the other hand, are unique and use useful sounds, like letters or sometimes syllables. When written down, graphemes are the letters or symbols which allow for written language. As you can see, these are all pretty straightforward. Next, Let's discuss paralinguistics, the study of nonverbal communication. The discovery of paralinguistics can be attributed to quite a few psychologists, but we're only going to discuss one, Edward Hall. Hall looked at proxemics, i.e. the space bubble. For instance, think about someone coming up to you six inches from your face. You're probably thinking, back off, or wow, this person has horrible coffee breath. But maybe you're thinking, hell yeah, I see where this is going. Now, now, there are differences in nonverbal signs which can differ from context to context, a term called pragmatics. I like to think of pragmatics as using certain signs when it's practical or pragmatic. Any type of nonverbal communication which is relating to touch is called haptic. H. Haptic. Think of communication with your hands. Any signs involving intonation is considered prosodic. Think phonemes or prosody, which stands for the rhythm and intonations of the language. Additionally, there are kinesics, which involve multiple behaviors that include emblems, which are gestures like your middle finger, regulators, which are conversational flow gestures like nodding your head, illustrators, which illustrate the concept like pointing, affect display, which is just nonverbal emotions, or affects relating to Ekman's facial expressions, and lastly, adapters, which are low awareness changes like adjusting your posture. Don't worry if you didn't catch all of those. They use mostly obvious definitions. Although development is discussed in developmental episodes, I want to hit two main points here. 
Up until about one year of age, most children are restricted to cooing and babbling. And then from this point, they will begin to speak only one-word phrases or hollow phrases. This is because it's like their head is hollow except for a handful of words, which they can only say one at a time. Between 12 to 18 months, they move up to the telegraphic phases because, with changing societal norms, they've already begun talking on the telephone and calling their friends. Well, no, it's actually just because they use two-word phrases but think telephone with telegraphic phrases. Then, they begin a language explosion. Now, there is an interesting phenomenon where multiple cultures without the same language come together, such as in slave populations. These cultures will inevitably make a crude means of communication called a pigeon. But the interesting part is that in just one generation, it can be made into a new succinct language called a creole. Now, back to development. At an early age, children begin to engage in categorical perception, which is teasing out differences in sounds to understand them as syllables or words. But in reality, much of our speech doesn't actually contain these distinct starts and stops in audition. This is the categorical perception. Children also begin to understand transformational grammar. The concept that a meaning can be stated in multiple ways, such as they were wasted last night and last night they were wasted. So you can transform the grammar, but keep the meaning. So transformational grammar. As these children develop, they also begin to understand some words as ultimate terms or emotion evoking, like connotations. For instance, did hearing the word wasted make you think of, yeah, those were great nights, or did you think, oh, I feel woozy? All right, so this is the end of the episode, but I want to finish up with a three-minute excerpt from Dr. Bloom of Yale in Psychology Lecture Series. It gives a brilliant insight into children learning language. Now, there aren't any new MCAT terms here, so you can feel free to skip to the next episode. There are many Americans who believe that they need to teach their children language. And there's a huge industry with uh, DVDs and flashcards and all sorts of things designed to teach your children language. And I think many parents believe that if they didn't persist in using these things, their children would never learn to speak. But we know that that's not true. We know that this isn't true because there are communities where they, um, they don't speak to their kids. They don't speak to their kids because they don't believe it's important to speak to their kids. Some linguists would interview, linguists would interview adults in these communities and say, why don't you speak to your babies? And these adults would respond, it would be ridiculous to speak to a baby. The baby has nothing to say. You might as well just speak to your dog. And then the American linguist would say, yeah, we speak to our dogs. Um, <laughs> Americans and Europeans speak to everything and everybody. Other cultures are more picky and they don't talk to children until the children themselves are talking. This doesn't seem to make much of a difference in language learning. Some studies have motivated by Chomsky's critique of Skinner's verbal behavior, have asked, even in, what if we just looked at children within the United States? Don't these, these children get feedback? And the answer is yes and no. So your average highly educated Western parent does give their children feedback, do give their children feedback, based on what they say. But they don't typically give feedback based on the syntax or grammaticality of what they say. The example given by Brown and Hanlon in the classic study in the 1970s is they did all these studies looking at what children say and how parents responded. And it turns out parents respond not to the grammatical correctness, but to the affect or cuteness or sociability of the utterance. So for instance, if a child says to his mother, I loves you, mommy, it's a very unusual parent who say, oh no, the verb agreement is mistaken. <laughs> you've, you've added a redundant S, uh, it, it's not appropriate. Similarly, if, if a child is to say, you know, I, I hate your guts, mother, it's an unusual mother, that's wonderful, it's subject, verb, object, the whole thing, structurally fine. You know, we respond to our kids like we respond to each other, based on the message that's conveyed, not the grammatical utterances. Children make grammatical mistakes all the time, but then they go away, and they go away without correction.